Welcome to some very famous people you've never really heard of. Bite-sized biographies of the famous, the infamous, and the quirky in less than an hour. My name is Philip D. Gibbons, and there is more information about me, this podcast, and a bibliography at someveryfamouspeople.com. There are also photographs of many of the individuals and items mentioned in this podcast. At the conclusion of part one of this presentation, there will be additional suggestions concerning further information about today's subject, McDonald's Corporation mastermind, Ray Kroc. Now let's get started with our story about Ray Kroc. In 1954, Raymond Ray Kroc had already spent 32 years as a salesman and entrepreneur, mostly in the food services industry, with the exception of a stint in Florida as a real estate broker that was ended by the Depression and the crash in land prices nationwide. Kroc spent almost three decades working as a salesman for two entities the Lily Tulip Cup Company, manufacturer of paper cups, and Prince Castle, a manufacturer of a device known as the Multi-Mixer, an industrial-powered mixer that was strong enough to blend ice cream into a much thicker and more popular milkshake. This machine was invented and used by Earl Prince, a mechanical engineer, and Walter Friedenhagen, an ice cream manufacturer and their small Illinois-based chain of shops that sold ice cream-related products, a business that boomed as an alcohol substitute during Prohibition. Other mixers and blenders, especially Hamilton Beach products, were not able to handle mixing the thicker amounts of ice cream required in what was sold in Prince Castle shops as the one-in-a-million malted shake. Ray Kroc first interacted with Prince Castle as the Chicago-based account manager for Lily Tulip, and sensing the enormous potential of the multi-mixer device, he secured the national distribution rights for the machine in 1939. For two years, he rapidly increased sales, his customers mostly the corner drugstores and soda fountains that were a mainstay of urban America. Just as Kroc began to build national momentum for his sales distribution company, America entered World War II, a development that cut off two staples necessary for his continued growth. Civilian access to copper, a critical element of his multi-mixer motors, was halted. Any supplies of this metal earmarked for military consumption. Sugar was also heavily rationed so that products like ice cream were virtually unavailable during wartime. Rather than shutting down, Kroc improvised, determined to tough it out until the end of the war. He found two additive products consisting of mostly corn syrup and a chemical stabilizer that when mixed with chilled milk resulted in something that mimicked ice cream. Even then, Kroc and his customers understood that this solution was only a temporary fix until normal market conditions returned. After the war, they did, and like many consumer staples, ice cream and related product sales skyrocketed, Kroc taking advantage of this tidal wave of pent-up demand. By the late 40s, Multimixer was selling 9,000 units annually, and his company, now employing a national network of salesmen and a central sales processing function, earned Kroc a considerable income, an affluent Chicago suburban existence, and even a country club membership. But this market dominance didn't last long. Two elements again threatened Kroc's niche business, reducing his sales in the early 50s to only 2,000 units a year. Hamilton Beach responded with a cheaper, sturdier-for-them model that could mix multiple shakes at a time. And the market itself started to change as younger families departed the inner city for cheap, suburban tract housing. Suddenly, the corner ice cream parlor, or drugstore soda fountain, was becoming a shrinking market anachronism. Milkshakes in their current form were also being displaced by a completely different product, soft ice cream marketed nationally by the likes of both Dairy Queen and Tasty Freeze, two expanding national chains that merely dispense this innovation by pouring it directly from a machine. 
Ray Kroc spent the early 50s assessing his dwindling sales and attempting to prop up his distribution company with various other mostly food-oriented implements, like a square ice cream scoop that made dispensing the frozen substance easier. None of these gadgets caught on. It was in early 1954 that Kroc decided that at the very least, to try and buck up his sales numbers, he wanted to learn more about a restaurant run by two brothers in San Bernardino, California, who had ordered 10 multi-mixers for their small Southern California location. He even asked his West Coast rep how such a small restaurant could need enough machines to prepare as many as 60 shakes at a time, and then decided to go see for himself. If nothing else, this restaurant was generating orders from other hamburger joints that were trying to copy this business, called McDonald's, to duplicate their wild success. As Ray Kroc's legend eventually grew, his interaction with the McDonald's brothers, Richard and Maurice, a.k.a. Dick and Mac, was depicted as him identifying this diamond in the rough and developing it into his eventual hamburger juggernaut phenomenon. But the McDonald's restaurant that opened in 1940 at 14th and E Street in San Bernardino, California, was by 1954 an industry phenomenon and the subject of a front-page story in an industry trade journal routinely contacted by prospective restaurateurs attempting to find out as much as possible. The two McDonald's brothers had already established themselves among the most successful businessmen in the region. They were not the first American entity to market hamburgers in quantity. In fact, that product was developed as early as 1921 by E.W. Billy Ingram in an 11-state restaurant chain known as White Castle. The McDonald's were not even the first to market specialty hamburgers in Southern California. In 1937, a Glendale, California owner of a drive-in restaurant, Robert Wien, invented a double-decker hamburger sandwich slathered with various condiments and toppings that was so successful he called it the Big Boy and prompted a restaurant name change to Bob's Big Boy, eventually another successful nationwide hamburger chain. The McDonald's brothers would impact the rapidly evolving American fast food landscape by implementing some concepts that were, at the time, revolutionary. Although quite successful, their drive-in restaurant incorporated the car hop delivery system in which individuals, usually teenage females, offered curb or parking lot service on a tray, which was popular with teenagers but turned their location into a hangout where the parking lot was filled with leather-jacketed youngsters who took up space for hours and also alienated older families with children who did not like such an atmosphere. Car hops were also expensive to hire and retain, their high turnover making them a pricey and inefficient business model. Mac and Dick also figured out that most of their receipts came from hamburgers, although they served other items like barbecued ribs and pork, cooked in a central wood fire pit. All of their meals were served on dishes with utensils, which frequently were pilfered and required a dishwasher. In 1948, the McDonald's shut down their restaurant and took three months to radically change their menu and their process. Instead of car hops, they turned the two car hop service windows into walk-up space for customers to place their orders directly with a cashier. At least 20 car hop positions were eliminated, as well as a dishwasher when plastic, paper, and bags were substituted for china and metal. The owners came to believe that their customers wanted food as quickly as possible so they eliminated the barbecue pit, greatly expanded their griddle space, and created an assembly line process in which each employee was responsible for only one aspect of preparation. This included a specific condiment recipe that included ketchup, mustard, onions, and two pickles. Substitutions were discouraged by requiring more time. The owners cut the menu to basically four food items, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, potato chips, and apple pie three types of soft drinks, milk, and coffee. They reduced the size of the burgers, also reduced the price to 15 cents, about half of the typical price of other burger restaurants. At first, the idea did not catch on, but Dick and Mac held out on going back to the old system, added French fries and milkshakes back to the menu, and waited. The shakes were eliminated because pouring them out of their metal canisters into a paper cup took too long. 
So the McDonald's brothers customized their multi-mixers to prepare milkshakes by attaching the paper cups directly to the machine. As the car hop hangout atmosphere dissipated, working class families began to descend on the restaurant in greater numbers, eating at a restaurant now a viable economic alternative. Children also enjoyed going up to the window, ordering, and then bringing back the food to their car, all under the watchful eyes of their parents, a lesson in independence. The building itself was different, with an octagonal shape and glassed-in design from the roof to the countertop. The always immaculate kitchen, with its stainless steel grills and efficient employees, a revelation to most customers who had never yet set eyes on a restaurant interior. On the roof was a huge neon sign with the McDonald's name and their mascot, Speedy, the symbol for what they dubbed the Speedy Delivery System. Within a year, the restaurant regained the same volume it had before its realignment. It further streamlined its production line process with customized tools and extremely specific guidelines, and perhaps to maintain a focused, completely business-like approach, especially among younger employees, only males were hired. McDonald's mushroomed into a high-volume, unique operation with eventually spectacular results. Ray Kroc was also not the first individual to discuss potentially franchising the McDonald's name and concept. In fact, by the time Kroc approached them, the brothers had actually sold 15 franchises. Well, sort of. What they sold was a manual describing the speedy delivery service, some building plans, one week of training with a store manager, and the McDonald's name for a fee of $1,000. They specifically did not provide any financial or business connection on any ongoing basis, the franchisees strictly on their own. Even this process was something that Mac and Dick did not pursue aggressively. They were actually afraid that any widespread number of locations would eventually reflect on their business if franchisees did not live up to high standards of food quality and cleanliness. They were also content with splitting the $100,000 net income their restaurant raked in in 1953. They had no children, very little interest outside of their business, and no inclination towards establishing a financial legacy. One of the McDonald's commented at the time, We'd have to leave money to a church, and we don't go to church. So intent on enjoying their financial independence and cutting what must have been a backbreaking schedule, the McDonald's even turned down a deal from the Carnation Corporation to finance rapid expansion and a partnership that only required that they use Carnation's milkshake mix in a chain that eventually would go nationwide. They said no, understanding that it required spending the foreseeable future building and staffing the new locations, possibly for the rest of their lives. But in early July of 1954, as Ray Kroc sat in the parking lot at 14th and East Street, he wasn't necessarily impressed with the building's exterior. It was not until a year later that the brothers installed the neon golden arches design that they adapted from one of their own franchisees. Getting to the location by car a full hour before lunchtime, he observed lines already forming. By noon, the lot was completely filled but Kroc was even more astonished by how quickly each order was filled, approximately 15 seconds. He then got online and made conversation with some of the customers, hearing nothing but high praise for the food, the cost, and even how sparkling clean the operation was. He also observed that every third customer or so ordered a shake, which explained the necessity for so many multi-mixers. Kroc waited for the lunchtime rush to abate, but it never really did. Finally, he went inside and introduced himself to the McDonald brothers and thanked them for their multi-mixer support. The conversation quickly shifted to business, with Kroc asking them when the rush would die down. Sometime late tonight, was the nonchalant reply. Ray Kroc had spent most of his adult life in the food service business and observed all sorts of restaurant operations, all with varying degrees of efficiency and profitability but he had never seen anything like the well-oiled machine run by the McDonald's. With his entrepreneurial mindset, he not only grasped that this was a unique operation, but also that personally getting involved with this business might very well be his long-term solution to a decline in the sale of multi-mixers. Kroc's timing was fortuitous. The McDonald's were so disinterested in their 
insubstantial franchising business that they had outsourced the process to an individual who eventually resigned for health reasons. They hadn't been in any hurry to replace this individual until Kroc, upon returning to Chicago, suggested that he take the position. When Mac and Dick agreed in principle, Kroc was on the next flight out to the West Coast to hammer out a deal. Typically, the McDonald's brothers were adamant on setting the franchise fees and percentages franchisees would have to pay to Kroc to help run their locations. Both numbers were literally among the lowest franchise fees in the industry and a terrible deal for Kroc, but he took it anyway, believing that his multi-mixer's most profitable days were behind him and McDonald's was his best alternative for the future. He then reasoned that he could sell multi-mixers to all of the new franchisees, but ultimately realized that this would never sustain that part of his business. His real opportunity was in fast food, the McDonald's way. By March 2, 1955, Kroc formed McDonald's System Incorporated, eventually changed to the McDonald's Corporation in 1960. Asked years later why he didn't just essentially rip off the McDonald's operations model, like so many others attempted to do in the mid-50s, Kroc's reply was that he didn't want to repeat many of the mistakes the brothers had made, and as essentially a salesman, he didn't want to have to learn those mistakes on his own. Most restaurant franchise business models revolved around the franchiser extracting large upfront fees, mandatory sales of marked-up supplies, and onerous percentages that extracted even more money, rendering long-term success difficult for the franchisee and secondary to the franchiser. Some even demanded kickbacks from their own suppliers, rationalizing this payment as a byproduct of such a large order. Kroc, although he had no choice based on his agreement, sold his franchises as a long-term collaboration that would be profitable for everybody. He initially viewed California as a great untapped opportunity. Of his first 18 franchise sales, nine were in California. This immediately became problematic. With Kroc thousands of miles away, these franchisees very quickly started to run amok, deviating from the McDonald's system in every possible way. At the very least, to try to even determine what was happening on the West Coast, Kroc sent one of his employees, Fred Turner, out there to see what was going on firsthand. Turner returned with news that the restaurants were raising prices, adding all kinds of items including Mexican food, pizza, and chili to the menu, serving poor quality food, and worst of all, operating filthy restaurants that even appalled the industry newcomer, Turner. Kroc responded by suspending any further California franchise sales and attempted to refocus on the greater Chicago area. He hit an immediate snag when he found out in the course of attempting to sell some additional multi-mixers to a Chicago-based ice cream company, the Fragic Ice Cream Company, that this entity had purchased a McDonald's franchise for all of Cook County, and the brothers who ran this company intended to build four restaurants. Ray Kroc practically ran back to the office, got the McDonald brothers on the phone, and demanded an explanation in their typically almost naive fashion. Mac and Dick explained that the deal had been in the works before the brothers even met Kroc, and it really wasn't important because Ray still had the rest of the entire U.S. to work with. Kroc emphatically explained that Cook County was crucial to him because it was where he was headquartered and the backyard of all of his suppliers. Threatening to cancel their entire contract, Kroc slammed down the phone before the Fluster brothers could react. Eventually, through his multi-mixer rep on the West Coast, Kroc apologized and methodically worked out a deal in which the Fragics sold him back the territory at a premium. The cost was $25,000, of which the McDonald's agreed to pay $10,000. Kroc was on the hook for the rest. He took out a second mortgage on his home to raise the money. This did little to abate the stress within his marriage. His wife, Ethel, already upset by his endless business trips and mounting debt, raised latest quest to her the craziest of all. Who was going to buy California hamburgers in the middle of winter in Chicago? If nothing else, this exchange underlined certain personality traits of Ray Kroc to the McDonald's brothers that were unmistakable. If he was in endearment mode, he was a very jovial, backslapping, boisterously optimistic individual, but he had a bad temper, especially if he thought someone was attempting to mistreat him in a business deal. Kroc was 52 years old, 
had gout, hip issues, early stage diabetes, premature arthritis, and didn't hear very well. But he still possessed that fire in the belly to hit the ball out of the park and conquer the world. All bromides he used liberally every day of his professional life. He adjusted his plan to selling franchises in the Chicago vicinity, and understanding that sales would be easier if a customer could see a prototype, he convinced a country club buddy and home builder to partner with him on building his first McDonald's in De Plain, Illinois, which opened on April 15, 1955, the first McDonald's anywhere east of the Mississippi. The legend has it that Kroc initially showed up at the restaurant at 7 a.m. every morning to check with the manager and make sure the store was ready for business. He parked his car in the lot and walked three blocks to the train station that would take him to his office downtown. At the end of his workday, Kroc would take the train back and walk to the restaurant meticulously picking up litter, including any McDonald's trash that he deposited when he got to the restaurant. Kroc was determined to give his location the same sheen that permeated the original location in San Bernardino. Unfortunately, the investment community in the upper Midwest had a reaction similar to Ethel Kroc's. Hamburger stands were considered a seasonal business and not really substantive enough for institutional investors and entrepreneurs. No bank or lending institution would touch the idea. Kroc had a both credit and collateral. Ray then fell back on what to him was an obvious potential source of finance. His fellow members at his country club, the Rolling Green Country Club in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Arlington Heights was a middle-class suburb populated by mostly successful small business owners and corporate professionals like Ray Kroc. They were not the elitist multimillionaires living on the Gold Coast or in Lincoln Park. Initially, this peer group was not enthusiastic, but Kroc was not pushy. And in fact, his proposition was actually a very low risk opportunity for the franchisee because the fees and upfront costs were much smaller than the capital costs of a typical restaurant. And because Crocs to Plain location was already grinding out $200,000 in annual sales with an annual profit of $40,000, a franchisee stood to make their money back in a year. It was a no-brainer for individuals who were numbers savvy, already had successfully navigated small business success, and were swayed by Kroc's effervescent enthusiasm. Eighteen Rolling Green club members signed up, about half of the franchises that Kroc sold in his first three years of operation. However, the qualities that attracted these franchisees to McDonald's also were eventually problematic. In time, Kroc discovered that these investors were the worst kind of business partners because they violated most of the core principles Kroc already believed to be crucial for success. Their fast food venture was by definition a second business investment with absentee management handled on site by a hired employee. Most of these individuals also were just as independent and opinionated as Ray Kroc and by nature not likely to adhere to the strict guidelines that did not allow for any deviation especially if they felt they had a better, more profitable improvisation. Their absentee ownership also led to the same issues that plagued Kroc's problematic California franchises, a lack of food quality and a lack of cleanliness. Ray Kroc's perspective on the perfect franchisee was confirmed when a very different type of McDonald's operator opened its doors on May 26, 1955, in Waukegan, Illinois. The location was a literal bomb-and-pop operation, staffed initially by a married couple named Sandy and Betty Agate. They risked their entire life savings, Agate quitting his job as a press operator, his wife a door-to-door -door Bible salesperson who had called on Croc's LaSalle Street office address. From its very first day, business at the Waukegan location was remarkable. Agate had to call in emergency orders for both buns and meat, running out of product within hours of opening. Business was so good that the Agates couldn't fit all of their cash receipts into their two cash registers, filling up paper bags with the overflow. The banker who leased them the building and the property capped their monthly rent at $1,000, a percentage calculated on $20,000 of monthly sales, a figure he believed to be permanently unreachable. The Agates exceeded that figure in the first month, their location in a blue-collar community near a military base, an absolute gold mine. Very quickly, the store was averaging four times the revenue of Crocs to Plain location. 
But Kroc was not envious or resentful. In fact, he was thrilled. Now he had an actual example of another franchise other than his location that was not only prosperous, it was wildly successful. Within months, the Agates paid off their initial investment, and the Agates also fit the profile of the perfect McDonald's franchisee. Kroc sent his sales prospects to talk to the Agates personally, and they were only too happy to share their numbers and insight. Now, Kroc could also be a lot more selective about prospective buyers, the phone ringing off the hook with small business people having heard of the practically miraculous venture in Waukegan. Franchisees began to sign up in a radius that included Asheville, North Carolina, Newington, Connecticut, and Saginaw, Michigan. Crocs McDonald's operation was mushrooming in size, and he realized both his own personal limitations and that he needed to assemble a corporate structure to manage such a fast-growing entity. He already identified Fred Turner as an individual he wanted to include in his inner management circle. Then, in 1956, Kroc met with a former Tasty Freeze executive named Harry Sonneborn. Unlike Ray Kroc, who was a salesman and a marketing-minded entrepreneur who could barely interpret a balance sheet, Sonneborn was a classic numbers cruncher with a unique franchising industry idea. Typically, the franchisee leased land directly from a property owner and paid them rent. The franchisee would also go to a bank and get a mortgage to build the restaurant building. Initially, Sonneborn proposed that the McDonald's Corporation should find locations, negotiate a fixed long-term property lease, and then turn around and lease this to the franchisee at a markup. But the lease also potentially called for a percentage of the location's revenue once the location hit certain higher revenue numbers. So McDonald's was getting rent in the form of either lease payments or location sales. This actually became a selling point because it was explained to franchisees that McDonald's profit margins increased depending on how successful the franchisee became. Sonneborn quickly added a significant security deposit that was not refundable until the 15th year of the lease. In essence, a no-interest loan that McDonald's could utilize in its initially undercapitalized venture. Eventually, this model would morph into McDonald's buying properties and eliminating any underlying leaseholder and building restaurant locations and leasing those to the franchisee. This business idea was so powerful and profitable that it spawned a separate corporation known as the McDonald's Franchise Realty Corporation. Over time, as McDonald's grew, it was able to finance its purchase of real estate in installments, lasting years as revenue from this expansion poured in. But there was another ingenious aspect of this approach that solved Ray Kroc's insatiable need for control and uniformity of his franchisees. If these owners strayed from their compliance with corporate standards, as written into the permanent lease agreement, the lease could be immediately terminated. No longer could a renegade like some of Kroc's initial investors from the country club thumb their nose at him and his strict code of operation. They would be out of business. In fact, typically, Kroc was more excited about this aspect of the lease idea than the immense profit it could potentially generate. From day one, many of the changes that Ray Kroc implemented with his franchisees were technical violations of his contract with the McDonald's brothers. Although he realized that at the time, this contract was practically a straitjacket that merely authorized him to sell licensing of the McDonald's name for a small fee. Fundamentally, even his own DePlane's location was a contractual violation because Kroc was specifically proscribed from being a McDonald's licensee. For years, Kroc requested changes to the agreement, but the McDonald's brothers were painfully slow to respond, usually denied such requests, and never agreed to any changes in writing. Kroc responded in the short term by merely ignoring the contract's stipulations. Over time, Kroc realized that he had a major problem looming over the ever-approaching contract renewal. Kroc did have an option at the conclusion of the 10-year contract to renew for another 10 years, but the McDonald's also had the right to merely not renew, a simple process considering all of the violations, both great and small. They wouldn't even have to sue Kroc to regain control over all of his licensees. With that in mind, in 1960, Kroc began four years before the contract terminated to attempt to renegotiate. He demanded a new 99-year contract and greater autonomy in just about every area relevant to the continued operation of Kroc's company. 
Despite their pugnacious attorney's advice, the brothers did sign off on the 99-year lease, but only granted modest concessions in other areas. Kroc also had another contract-related problem, the inability to get any kind of financing for expansion as long as such an onerous contract existed. Any due diligence by an investor would reveal that Kroc's future entire McDonald's venture wasn't fully under his control and might even involve lengthy litigation. In 1960, Harry Sonneborn had actually managed to secure a $1.5 million loan from an insurance company, but that was by giving up 20% of McDonald's stock, a process that Kroc did not wish to repeat and was probably an impossibility anyway. To Kroc, it was clear he needed to buy Mac and Dick out. Historically, the McDonald's brothers' decision to sell out of what eventually became one of the largest corporations in U.S. history and a choice that literally cost them billions of dollars seems almost irrationally stupid and short-sighted. But there were actually, for them, some very solid reasons for their eventual choice. Their relationship with Ray Kroc, once collaborative and positive, was now one of acrimony and distrust although they were shielded from much of Kroc's direct hostility by their attorney, an individual named Frank Cotter, who could be just as nasty and assertive as Ray Kroc, the atmosphere was uncomfortable. Yes, they could get rid of Kroc if they wished, but that would merely create another headache involving them in the time-consuming process of either assuming control of or unwinding Kroc's ever-growing empire of franchises all over the country. They wanted no part of that. They also faced then what might have been a very onerous situation should either brother die, even under the current situation. Estate taxes in the 60s were much more confiscatory than what they are today, and any McDonald's heir, in this case the brother's wives, would be hit with an estate tax way in excess of any cash they could possibly raise. That was an issue that would only become more certain with each passing year. Both men were in their late 40s, they owned luxurious homes in Palm Springs, San Bernardino, and Santa Barbara, drove Cadillacs, had more money than they could have dreamed of when they entered business during the Depression. They even had an idea for a nationwide chain of motels. Why not sell out, get the hell away from Ray Kroc, and enjoy the financial freedom they always dreamed about? To them, it made all the sense in the world. But down to earth and sensible as they were, the McDonald's did not roll over for Kroc. They demanded $2.7 million in cash, knowing that after paying capital gains tax, they would both walk away with $1 million each, the equivalent of $10 million 2023 dollars. This was another basic reason for the deal, because the royalties they received were paid as income, not capital gains, at a 1960 tax rate of 50%, a much larger tax burden than a 25% one-time capital gain. They also wanted a one-time payment, no financing or installments. When Kroc tried to get a lower price or better terms, they wouldn't budge. In actuality, the purchase price for Kroc was irrelevant because he had nowhere near that kind of money and very little hope of raising it on the capital markets. Again, that's where Harry Sonneborn came in. His mission was basic, but initially seemed hopeless. He needed to find someone somewhere willing to lend a company that, according to its own balance sheet, was literally worth less than six figures, $2.7 million. Most New York and Chicago money managers wouldn't even talk to him. But one individual, John Bristol, listened to Sonneborn's pitch that revolved around McDonald's as a real estate play, not a food company. And Bristol was intrigued. He managed the endowments of several prestigious universities, including Princeton, he agreed to recommend the investment to his clients, but these clients would also have to okay the deal. With Princeton putting up the bulk of the money, $1 million, the trustee of Princeton's endowment, Dean Mathy, initially killed the deal, but another personal presentation by Sonneborn changed his mind. Even better, Sonneborn structured the deal with financial, not equity installments, and bonuses, McDonald's and Kroc not having to part with any more stock. The McDonald's brothers got their million-dollar checks. Urban legend claims that Kroc also promised in a handshake deal that he would continue to pay them their 5% royalty, but then stiffed them afterwards. Supposedly, the lenders refused to sign off on the loan if royalty payments were extended, the lenders' payments affected by McDonald's future income. 
but much of the reason for the buyout was escaping the royalty payments, and in fact, the McDonald's brothers used them as leverage, stipulating that if Ray Kroc wanted to pay in installments, they would continue to collect their royalties until they were paid off. Additionally, Mac and Dick's attorneys would have never agreed to such an arrangement, understanding both Kroc's hostility and the tremendous potential value involved. In fact, the deal did explode over another fundamental disagreement. With negotiations almost concluded, Kroc began to discuss with Richard McDonald the logistics of transfer of the original San Bernardino cash cow location. McDonald succinctly responded by telling Kroc that the original location was not part of the deal. This elicited another typical Kroc outburst, with Dick adamantly refusing to acknowledge any agreement to turn over the flagship location. Both brothers intended to give it to two longtime employees. Other than killing the deal, Kroc had zero recourse. That is, until the ink was dry on the buyout agreement. Ray Kroc then personally flew to the West Coast and bought some property a block away from the original McDonald's. Within a year, with an identical menu and design, and now the McDonald's name, this new location opened. At the old location, now legally having to change to a new name, in this case, to The Big M, the two former employees of Dick and Mac immediately struggled. By 1967, The Big M was grossing 25% of its former sales revenues. In 1968, the owners gave up and sold out to new ownership, who fared no better, closing the store for good in 1970. Finally, Kroc was freed from his corporate nemesis. But then his professional life suddenly and inevitably collided with his personal life. Despite years of workaholic devotion to McDonald, Kroc did not draw a salary until he was paid $75,000, in 1961. Kroc survived previously on income from his Prince Castle sales. The salary development was perhaps partially the result of a personal need for more money. Despite four decades and many years of dealing with a virtual absentee husband and serious anxiety over their household debt, Ethel Kroc was still hanging in on the marriage. That is, until in 1961, when Kroc said he wanted a divorce. Ethel settled for the house, the Lincoln automobile, and $30,000 a year in alimony. Part of Kroc's decision to divorce stemmed from a relationship that began when he met a potential licensee at an upscale Minneapolis restaurant. The keyboard player and singer at this restaurant was a stunning blonde named Joan Smith. Kroc was so smitten that he could barely focus on the meeting with Bob Zian, who owned the restaurant, The Criterion. Zian hired Joan Smith's husband, Raleigh Smith, to manage his first McDonald's and entered into a partnership with Smith when Zion purchased a second franchise. Because the Smiths were then part of the McDonald's corporate family, they frequently interacted with Ray Kroc, who eventually verbalized his romantic feelings to Joan directly. They agreed to leave their spouses, Kroc and Joan, relocating to Woodland Hills, California in 1961. They needed to cohabitate for six weeks to be able to get a quickie Nevada divorce. But five weeks into the arrangement, Joan balked. Her daughter disliked Kroc immediately, and her mother was appalled. Kroc had already sold his ownership of Prince Castle Distribution Company to senior executives for $150,000, essentially a loan, and was committed to relocating to the West Coast anyway to personally spearhead McDonald's West Coast expansion. Joan eventually had second thoughts about breaking off the engagement, but by then Kroc had moved on. Clearly uncomfortable with being single, he was quickly introduced to a 50-year-old divorcee, Jane Dobbins Green, who worked as an executive secretary for, among other people, John Wayne. After a courtship that lasted mere weeks, Kroc married Green on February 23, 1963. His move to the West Coast was also fortuitous in that it created some distance between him and Harry Sonneborn, as the two men were beginning to have fundamental disagreements on numerous basic aspects of growing the company. Primarily, Sonneborn wanted to go public and adhere to a conservative expansion of the chain. Kroc was pushing for 400 new outlets a year, corporate buybacks of some underperforming stores, and was wary of the scrutiny and process of going public an alternative that would impose both Wall Street and shareholder meddling. 
Kroc considered financial analysis time-wasting drudgery and did not want to drown in accounting minutia. He focused instead on sales numbers, reviewing reports of individual store sales on a daily basis, and calling Fred Turner in Chicago, who he essentially delegated to run operations for the corporation east of the Mississippi. Because the franchisees were a diverse group of separate operations across the U.S., some began to market their individual locations by taking charge of their own marketing and advertising. It became clear that much like the Disney Corporation, children could be an important driver of parents opting to take their families to McDonald's. On both radio and television, McDonald's focused on children's programming to reach this audience. During this time period, the TV character Bozo the Clown became a national phenomenon. The character itself, an intellectual property franchise that was purchased by local TV stations, who then cast their own local Bozo. Local McDonald's began the practice of personal appearances by these television clowns. The response from especially children was overwhelming. One of these local performers, a 25-year-old television host named Willard Scott, appeared on several children's daytime shows on Washington, D.C. TV station WRC in the early 60s, including the Bozo the Clown show. When the fad died down and the show was canceled, the local D.C. McDonald's franchisee couldn't book Bozo anymore. To continue making personal appearances, Scott came up with a new identity, a clown named Ronald McDonald. And when the McDonald's Corporation bought back the D.C. franchises, as they began to collectively do in the mid-60s, they acquired the rights to Ronald McDonald. Although Scott's iteration looked very little like the eventual national Ronald McDonald, Scott is credited with originating this character and continuing the focus on marketing to children. Thank you for listening to part one of this podcast about Ray Kroc. Much of the information for this podcast came from the books McDonald's Behind the Arches by John F. Love, Fast Food Nation by Eric Slosher, and Ray and Joan by Lisa Napoli. There are also additional photographs, bibliographical and musical information at someveryfamouspeople.com. If you have enjoyed this presentation, please like us at our Facebook page, Some Very Famous People, and follow us on Twitter at Philip D. Gibbons. Subscribe to my YouTube page at Noblesse Oblige, and also rate us on iTunes. If you have the time, leave a brief review. A link is provided at the website. (laughs) 